Hi there. In this video, we are going to learn about Amazon Redshift. So what is Amazon Redshift? It is a fully managed petabyte scale data warehouse service in the cloud. Redshift data warehouse is a collection of computing resources called as nodes, which are organized into a group called as a cluster. Each cluster runs an Amazon Redshift engine and contains one or more databases. So why to use Amazon Redshift? First of all, Amazon Redshift is specifically designed for online transaction processing, that is OLAP, and business intelligence applications that require complex queries against large datasets. It integrates with various data loading and ETL, that is extract, transform, and load tools, and business intelligence reporting, data mining, and analytics tools. It is based on PostgreSQL, so most existing SQL client applications will work with only minimal changes. The typical Amazon Redshift data warehouse architecture looks like this. The main components are client applications, the connection, and the cluster, which contains a leader node and a bunch of compute nodes. The main orchestrator here is the leader node. The leader node coordinates the compute nodes and handles external communication with the client applications by using JDBC and ODBC drivers for PostgreSQL. When a complex query comes from client application, the leader node develops an execution plan, which is also called as compiled code, and assigns each compute node a portion of that execution plan. The compute nodes have dedicated CPU, RAMP, and disk. So they do the actual job of executing the compiled code as per the portion of the execution plan that gets assigned to it. Just remember that there are two types of compute nodes, dense storage nodes and dense compute nodes. To reduce query execution time and improve the overall system performance, Amazon Redshift caches the result of certain types of queries in memory on the leader node. Now let us understand what workload management is in Amazon Redshift. The Amazon Redshift workload management basically enables users to flexibly manage priorities within workloads so that the short or the fast running queries will not get stuck behind the queues that are running long running queries. So your workload will basically contain the queues that have the queries that will get executed, right? So the workload management defines multiple query queues and route the queries to the appropriate queues at the runtime. In a scenario where there are multiple queries running at the same time, some queries might consume the cluster resources for longer periods of time and affect the performance of other queries. For example, Suppose one group of users submits occasional complex long running queries that select and sort rows from several large tables. Another group frequently submits shorter queries that select only few rows from one or two tables and run for just few seconds. In this scenario, the short running queries might have to wait in a queue for long running query to complete, right? So this is a problem. So the remedy to this problem is that you can improve the overall system performance and your user's experience by modifying the workload management plan. So you modify the workload management configuration to create separate queues for the long running queries and separate queue for the short running queries. By default, remember that Redshift configures one queue with a concurrency level of five. That means it enables you to run up to five queries concurrently, plus one predefined super user queue, which has a concurrency level of only one. And just remember that you can configure up to eight query queues and set the number of queries that can run in each of those queues concurrently. Hi there. In this video, we are going to learn some of the key differences between SQL and NoSQL databases. SQL databases are called as relational databases, that is RDBMS, relational database management system. Whereas NoSQL databases are called as non-relational 
or distributed databases, which means that the relationship between the data in the table or database is utmost important in SQL databases or SQL databases, whereas it does not hold that much importance or mandate in NoSQL databases. SQL databases are table-based databases, whereas NoSQL databases are document-based, key-value pairs, graph databases, or wide column stores. This means that SQL databases represent data in the form of tables, which consist of n number of rows of data, whereas NoSQL databases are the collection of key value pairs, documents, graph database, or wide column stores, which do not have standard schema definitions, which it needs to adhere to. SQL databases have predefined schema, whereas NoSQL databases have dynamic schema for unstructured data. SQL databases are vertically scalable. You can manage increasing load by increasing the CPU, RAM, SSD, etc. on a single server. On the other hand, NoSQL databases are horizontally scalable. That means you can just add few more servers easily in your NoSQL database infrastructure to handle the large traffic. SQL databases use SQL, that is Structured Query Language, for defining and manipulating the data, which is very powerful in NoSQL databases. Queries are supported, but they are focused on collection of documents. SQL databases support foreign keys that establish a reference with another table, whereas there is no foreign key concept in NoSQL databases. As far as complex queries are concerned, SQL databases are good fit for the complex query intensive environment, whereas NoSQL databases are not good fit for complex queries. But they are better suited for the hierarchical data storage as it follows the key value pair way of storing the data similar to JSON data. SQL databases are best fit for heavy duty transactional type applications. SQL databases emphasizes on ACID properties. ACID stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Whereas NoSQL databases follow the Brewer's Cap theorem, which consists of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Some of the examples of SQL databases are MS SQL, Oracle, and MySQL. Whereas DynamoDB and MongoDB are some of the prominent NoSQL databases. It is very important that you understand these differences before you go into learning DynamoDB. Hi there, in this video we are going to learn about DynamoDB. What is DynamoDB? It is a fully managed NoSQL database service that provides fast and predictable performance with seamless scalability. Whenever you think about high scalability, you should always think about DynamoDB as your database solution. Now, why to use DynamoDB? Well, first of all, it is fully managed by AWS. DynamoDB lets you offload the administrative burdens of operating and scaling a distributed database so that you don't have to worry about hardware provisioning or setup and configuration, replication, software patching, or even cluster scaling. Performance at scale. DynamoDB delivers consistent single-digit millisecond responsiveness at any scale. DynamoDB is distributed. That means it scales horizontally by expanding a single table over multiple servers. DynamoDB adds an in-memory cache that reduces the response times from milliseconds to microseconds without any application changes. DynamoDB provides fast access to local data by replicating tables across multiple AWS regions. Security. DynamoDB uses proven secure methods to authenticate users and prevent any unauthorized data access. DynamoDB contains many fundamental terms and concepts. Here is the list of some of the important ones. Now, the best way to learn these is to log in into the AWS console and learn as we come across them. So let's get started with the AWS console. As mentioned on your screen, Amazon DynamoDB is fast and flexible NoSQL database service 
for all application that need consistent single digit millisecond latency at any scale. It allows you to create tables, add and query items, and monitor and manage tables. But there is more to this. First, let's start creating a table. Now let us learn about table, items, and attributes. A table is basically just a collection of data. Note that since this is a NoSQL database, there is no schema associated with the table. Each table contains zero or more items. What is an item? An item is just a group of attributes that is uniquely identifiable among all the other items. Each item is composed of one or more attributes. An attribute is a fundamental data element, something that does not need to be broken down any further. See this example of a table. You have products table that has product ID as its primary key and other two attributes product name and price. Each collection of attributes or row is called as an item. So there are four items in this table. Whereas there are three columns that are called as the attributes. What is a primary key? A primary key is an attribute that uniquely identifies each item in the table so that no two items can have the same key. There are two ways in which you can define the primary key. A simple primary key composed of one attribute. The output of the internal hash function of partition key value determines the partition. That is the physical storage internal to DynamoDB in which the item will be stored. This is very important to understand. In a table that has only a partition key, no two items can have the same partition key value. The second type of primary key is a partition key and sort key. So this is a composite key. This is a composite primary key that consists of two attributes, partition key and a sort key. The output from the internal hash function of partition key value determines the partition in which the item will be stored. All the items with the same partition key are stored together and in a sorted order that is sorted by using the sort key value. In a table that has a partition key and a sort key, it's possible for two items to have the same partition key value. However, those two items must have different sort key values. Each primary key attribute must be a scalar. Scalar means single value. The only data types allowed for primary key attributes are string, number, or binary. There are no such restrictions for other non-key attributes. Let's go ahead and create a table here. Give it a suitable name. I'm going to call my table as products. Now here you can create a primary key, which is a simple key or a composite key. I'm going to select product ID as my primary key. I'm going to add a sort key as well. Now currently with this setting, there are no secondary indexes and there are some default settings that have been applied. Let's go ahead and uncheck this checkbox. Now here you can create some secondary indexes. What are secondary indexes? Let's learn about it. A secondary index is an alternate way of querying for information. It basically lets you query the data in the table using an alternate key in addition to queries against the primary key. Note that secondary indexes are completely optional. Data can be read from the index in the same way as you do from the table using a query or scan. We are going to learn about query and scan a little bit later. The table from which the index obtains the data is called as its base table. There are two types of secondary indexes, global and local. Global secondary index or GSI. GSI is an index with a partition key and sort key that can be different from those on the table. Global means that the queries on the index can span all the data in the base table across all partitions. The second one is local secondary index or LSI. This is an index that has the same partition key as the table but different sort key. 
Local means that every partition on a local secondary index is scoped to a base table partition that has the same partition key value. Now note that you can define up to five global secondary indexes and five local secondary indexes per table. That is the current limitation. Let's take an example. Look at this table. It has product ID as the partition key and product name as the sort key. So together they form the primary key. Now global secondary index can have its partition key and sort key different than these two. So you can define a GSI like this. It has same partition key as that defined on the table, but a different sort key, let's say price. Or you can define different partition key as well as different sort key altogether. For example, price and quantity. However, local secondary index has the same partition key that is defined on the table. So you can have this combination as the LSI, but you cannot have this combination as the local secondary index. Let's go ahead and add our secondary indexes. Note that as soon as I give a different name than that of primary key, the create as local secondary index becomes disabled. However, as soon as I give the same primary key name, which is product ID, and as soon as I add a sort key, remember LSI has to be a composite key. You can see that the create as local secondary index box is enabled. Let's go ahead and add our local secondary index here. Let's add our global secondary index and I'm going to index it on the product name. I can make it as a simple key or a composite key. I'm going to add a sort key as well. Now let's take a look at the differences between global secondary index and local secondary index. In global secondary index, the primary key can be simple or composite. However, in local secondary index, the primary key must be composite. That means it must have a partition key and a sort key. In global secondary index, partition can be of any attribute on the table. Whereas in local secondary index, the partition key must be the same as the table's partition key. The GSI can be created later or added to an existing table. However, local secondary index must be created during the time of the table creation. You cannot add LSI later. Global secondary index allows you to query over entire table. However, using local secondary index, you can query over a single partition only. Global secondary index supports eventual consistency only whereas local secondary index supports both eventual as well as strong consistency. When your application writes data to a DynamoDB table and receives an HTTP 200 response which is OK response, it gets confirmed that the write has occurred and is durable. However, when it comes to reading the data from the DynamoDB table, DynamoDB supports two types of read consistency, eventual consistency and strong consistency reads. What is an eventual consistent read? When the data is read immediately after a write operation, it may not always be up to date. The most up to date data will be returned in a short amount of time, usually within just a fraction of second. By default, a query operation performs an eventually consistent read. The second type is strong consistent read. When the data is read, DynamoDB returns a response with the most up-to-date data that reflects the updates from all prior write operations that were successful.
When you create a table or an index in DynamoDB, you must specify your capacity requirements for read and write activity. By defining your throughput capacity in advance, DynamoDB can reserve the necessary resources to meet the read and write activity your application requires while ensuring consistent low latency performance. You can also opt for on-demand capacity reservation. The throughput capacity is defined in terms of read capacity units and write capacity units. What is a read capacity unit? A read capacity unit equals one strongly consistent read per second or two eventually consistent reads per second for an item up to 4 KB in size. Whereas write capacity unit equals one write per second for an item up to 1 kilobyte in size. We are going to see an example of read capacity unit and write capacity unit in just a few minutes. Remember that if your read or write request exceed the throughput settings for a table, DynamoDB can throttle that request to prevent the application from consuming too many capacity units. Remember that capacity units cost you money. When a request is throttled, it fails with an HTTP 400 code and it throws a provision throughput exceeded exception. Now let's take an example of throughput capacity. Let us say you reserve one read capacity unit and one write capacity unit for your products table or any table. Then what all can you do with this capacity? Well, if you are trying to read items from the table and if your application demands strong consistency with one read capacity unit, your application can read an item that is up to 4 KB. However, if your application demands eventual consistency, then you would be able to read one item up to 8 KB or two items of 4 KB each using one read capacity unit. So for strong consistency, you can read one item that is up to 4 KB or if it is eventual consistency, you can read one item up to 8 KB or two items of 4 KB each. If you are doing write operation, you can only write an item of 1 KB with one write capacity unit. There is no strong consistency or eventual consistency for writes. So with one write capacity unit, you can only write an item worth 1 KB. Now let us look at this. Now let us look at this in another way. Let us say if you want to read or write an item that is of size x kilobyte and we are talking everything about one read per second or one write per second. If an item is of size x, how much capacity do you need to store it? Well, for read, you need to first check whether you want eventual consistency or strong consistency. If you are looking for eventual consistency, then you have to divide that x by 8 or 1 whichever is greater. Let's say if x is equal to 16 then you will need to provision 2 read capacity units or if x is let's say 2 KB then you will have to provision 1 read capacity unit x by 8 or 1 whichever is greater. However, if your application demands strong consistency then you have to divide that x by 4 or 1 whichever is greater. So if x is equal to 16 you will have to provision 4 read capacity units. And note that if the result is a fraction, then take the next natural number. For writes, it is easy. If an item is of size x, you will need x amount of write capacity units. Let us take a look at this table. For item of 1 KB, for eventual consistency, you will divide 1 by 8, which is a fraction number. 1 is greater than that, so you will need 1 read capacity unit for eventual consistency and strong consistency. For item size 8 KB, you will need 1 read capacity unit for eventual consistency. But for strong consistency, you will require 2 read capacity units. Now let us take a look at number 92. If your item is of size 92 KB, then 92 by 8 which comes down to a fraction 11.5, you take the next natural number which is 12. So you will need 12 
read capacity units for eventual consistency. For strong consistency, you will need 92 by 4, which is 23 read capacity units. Now note that this read capacity and write capacity calculation is done for kilobytes per second. So if you take an example of 10 megabytes, then you have to convert the item size into kilobytes and then do all your calculations per second. So in exam, you need to look out for the wordings. Do you have kilobytes per second or do you have megabytes per second? You need to convert megabytes into kilobytes and then minutes or hours into seconds. Now note that the amount of item size becomes your write capacity units. Now for our table, now for our table, let's go ahead and set up the provision capacity. Now with this option, you can determine the read write capacity mode. Do you want to provision it beforehand or do you want to provision it on demand? Remember that you need to select on demand if you want to pay only for the read and writes that you perform with no capacity planning beforehand. With 5 read capacity units, you can read an item that is of size 20 kilobytes if it is strong consistent or 40 kilobyte if it is eventual consistent application. With 5 write capacity units, you can write an item of 5 KB in your table or 5 items with 1 kilobyte in this table. Hi there. In this video, we are going to learn about auto scaling option provided by DynamoDB. Now we already know auto scaling concept in EC2. In DynamoDB, auto scaling works fairly the same way. So what does auto scaling do? Auto scaling basically adjusts the provision throughput capacity on your behalf. It enables a table or a global secondary index to increase its provision read and write capacity to handle sudden increases in traffic without throttling. Remember that if you go out of your provision capacity, DynamoDB is going to throw provision throughput exceeded exception. So auto scaling takes care of that and it does not let any exception occur. It increases the read and write capacity on your behalf. When the workload decreases, the application auto scaling decreases the throughput so that you don't have to pay for unused provision capacity. Remember that in order to use auto scaling, you need to define an auto scaling service linked role via IAM. Now here you can define auto scaling for either read capacity or write capacity or both. You can define target utilization here. That means if your application utilization reaches 70%, auto scaling is going to provision more capacity to your tables. The minimum provision capacities are 5 units and maximum defined by default are 40,000 units. As I mentioned, you need to create an IAM role that is auto scaling service linked role in order to utilize the auto scaling option. DynamoDB employs encryption at rest. That is, it encrypts the data that is persisted in the DynamoDB tables, local secondary indexes and global secondary indexes. Remember that DynamoDB uses advanced encryption standard 256 encryption. Encryption at rest can be enabled only when you are creating a new DynamoDB table. You cannot add encryption at rest on an existing table. After encryption at rest is enabled, it cannot be disabled. When creating a new table, you can choose one of the following customer master keys to encrypt your table. AWS owned CMK which is a default encryption type. Here, the key is owned by DynamoDB and you have no additional charge. Second is AWS Managed CMK where the key is stored in your account and it is managed by AWS Key Management Service. Finally, remember that when you access an encrypted table, DynamoDB decrypts the table data transparently. For this table, just use the default encryption option and create the table.
let us learn about query versus scan operations. The query operation finds items based on primary key value. Just like SQL query, where you can query on the primary key value to return a set of data. You must provide the name of the partition key attribute and a single value for that attribute in order to query the data. Whereas a scan operation always scans the entire table or secondary index. Remember that you should avoid using a scan operation on a large table or index. We have created a products table in DynamoDB. Let us go to items and add new items. Let us start adding new items here. I have added three items to this table. On this table, you can perform two operations. One is scan and the other is a query. Now let us first perform a query operation. Here you need to query based on partition key which is product ID. I am going to give P003. And say start search. And you can see that the query has written an item that belongs to product ID P003. If you do a scan operation and just say start search, it is going to return all the items in this table. Hi there. In this video, we are going to learn about DynamoDB streams. One of the most important architectural considerations when a database is involved is to keep track of the changes that are made to the database and also in what order they are made, right? This is where DynamoDB streams are very important. DynamoDB streams is an optional feature that captures the data modification events in DynamoDB tables in real time and in the same order of the occurrence. How does it work? Well, basically whenever an event occurs with respect to the DynamoDB table, it creates a stream record. These are the events and this is what the stream captures in those events. Let's say when a new item is added to the table, the stream captures the image of the entire item including all its attributes. If an item is updated, then the stream captures before and after image of the modified attributes. However, if an item is deleted from the table, the stream captures the entire item before deletion. Each stream record also contains the name of the table, the event timestamp and other metadata. It is guaranteed to be delivered only once. This is important to remember. Stream record is removed from the stream after 24 hours. So it is available till then to do the event management or to do some diagnostic analysis, etc. DynamoDB streams can be used together with AWS Lambda to create a trigger, a code that executes automatically whenever an item of interest appears in a stream or Kinesis client library or the AWS DynamoDB APIs. Let us take an example. Let's say you have a products table, then you add a new item or a new product to this table. A new stream record is then written to reflect this insertion of the new item to the table. This action then triggers an AWS Lambda function which is configured in such a way that it reads the product details from the table and publishes a message to a topic that is defined in the Amazon SNS, which then modifies the subscriber, say via an email about the new product getting added. 
So these are the steps in this workflow. If you select the table products and go to overview, you can get the stream details here. Currently the stream is not enabled. Click on manage stream. The view type you can select is keys only or a new image, old image or new and old images. Remember that with new and old images option, both the new and the old images of the item will be captured if there is any update to an item in this table. Click enable to enable capturing of the streams. Hi there. In this video, we are going to learn about DynamoDB Accelerator, in short DAX or DAX. What is a DAX? DAX is a DynamoDB compatible caching service that enables you to benefit from fast in-memory performance for demanding application. So DAX is a cache for DynamoDB. DynamoDB Accelerator delivers fast response times virtually in microseconds for accessing eventually consistent data. For read heavy workloads, it provides increased throughput and potential operational cost savings by reducing the need to over provision read capacity units. So if a caching solution is provisioned, then it is going to reduce the load on the read operations from your table. So it is going to save you quite a lot of cost. How does it work? Well, your application first writes data to DynamoDB. From the DynamoDB tables, the frequently accessed data is written to cache, which is DynamoDB Accelerator. Once the data is there, the application reads the data from the cache first before hitting the table. This way, the load of the read operations is reduced on your DynamoDB tables.